Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, it is absolutely wonderful to welcome all of you. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, and tonight's virtual tour of Soweto is a very special uh, tour for us and occasion for us to not speak about faraway places, not speaking only about genocide or the Holocaust or human rights in faraway places, but also to look at ourselves here in South Africa with our history of apartheid, with our painful history of human rights abuse, mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. learn from our own, from a friend, from a, key, a colleague, uh, from yes. Tumi. Yes. My name is Tali Do we have May. sound? No, we don't have sound. Why not? This, this Please, is, if you don't mind to mute it's yourself. It's, 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 you can hear what you're uh, saying. If everyone can mute themselves, that will be great. Um, so let me start again. My name is Tali Nates. I'm the director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And I really would love to welcome all of you from near and from far, from our three centers in South Africa, the Cape Town, Durban, and Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. I see many colleagues uh, from different organizations around the world. I see Holocaust survivors, Modem, Pinchas Guta. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I see many supporters, uh, members, partners from different organizations. I see uh, Ian Brown from the Salzburg Global Seminar joining us tonight. Thank you so much for joining. And many old and new friends. It's really wonderful to have you all here tonight. Who we are, the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center is a center of memory, education, dialogue, and of course, lessons for humanity. So we look at the past to learn lessons for today. And tonight's webinar is held in partnership with the SILT Foundation. And uh, the director of the SILT Foundation, Indra Vuso, will address us shortly and uh, tell us more about their foundation and the work we do together on many, many occasions. But presenting tonight, really his own personal story will be a special friend. He will attempt to give you a glimpse of Soweto for those that visited Soweto, you all know how large it is, how complicated the history is. So what we will try to do is a taste of Soweto in the webinar tonight. And uh, our friend Itumeleng Moses Mohope, but known to all of us as Tumi, is going to tell us his story and he's going to share it with us some of the images and the sound bites of his Soweto. So let me introduce Tumi to you uh, officially. Tumi was born in Zone 9 in Meadowlands, Soweto, as the fifth son of a family of nine boys and one girl. Finishing his schooling in Soweto, he has witnessed the 1976 Soweto uprising, the 1984 to 1990 unrest, and he was detained by the apartheid police. He was shot by the police. He was stabbed. He survived even a necklacing during apartheid. So his story is full of trauma and he will share that with us tonight. Tumi though became a dancer. He trained in ballet, contemporary and jazz dance at the Johannesburg Dance Foundation and the Johannesburg Youth Ballet. He danced for many dance companies in Johannesburg, in Durban, in London, in Cologne, and in Egypt. Tumi also danced with Pact Ballet that many South Africans, of course, know very well, and with the South African uh, Ballet. And later, working as a volunteer for South African Ballet, he taught in uh, Mamelodi, in Soweto, and in Katlahong. Tumi won the Michelle Tesson Scholarship, the FNB Vita Award for the best contemporary dancer, 
in Durban. And today, to me, is a project manager for the Silk Foundation and still teaches ballet in Soweto. He's also a celebrated tour guide. And today, he will combine his tour guide with his artistic personality, but more than anything, with his personal story. He uh, will tell us his story, and then we'll be open for a Q&A and even a discussion. So I uh, ask you all to please put your uh, comments, even thoughts in the chat during his time. And of course, uh, while he's talking, you can pose your questions. Now, first of all, I would like to invite Indra Vuso, the director of the Silt Foundation here in Johannesburg to address us. Indra, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for your wonderful introduction, Charlie. I'm so honored and proud that we work together. I mean, our first um, project together was the invitation of Sally Perel, a Holocaust survivor with a very special story um, to South Africa. And you can imagine a 95 year old coming from Isra Israel, traveling and talking to young South Africans. That was really something very, very special. The Zürt Foundation is very happy to have this event with Tumi. I also saw a lot of our friends and residents from the Zürt Foundation program. We do residents for artists, writers, theater makers, composers, and all of them go actually with Tumi to Soweto and he shows them his Soweto, which is much more interesting than what you would usually get when you work or go with a normal tourist tour because it talks about his story, about how he grew up actually as a child of the Soweto uprising, how he actually danced away, so to say, his trauma and became a very gentle and lovely person um, who really took, as Edith Eger said, the choice to really put the trauma into something positive and didn't in, not into despair and works very much and is part of our project that deal with reconciliation. So one last remark, because, you know, we have load shedding again. Now there are so many different things happening. Unfortunately, there's something happening with a video that it's only half finished. So we have to improvise a little bit. So please be patient, but be clear to me is a fabulous storyteller and you will enjoy this very much. So thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Indra, and to me now, the floor is yours. Okay, you can talk. Hello, everyone. I hope you can see me. Um, um, I just want to make sure if I can be heard. Yes, you are heard okay. loud and clear, and we see your screen. Okay, yes, my screen and I will stop and start and um, please bear with me uh, as this is a improvised kind of a thing sometimes. Um, I will just stop and start sometimes. So this will be like an introduction to my life. introduce myself again and I'm gonna stop here because I just because we're talking about Soweto and all that but uh, the best symbol of Soweto um, that's what many people don't know is that Soweto is actually surrounded by five mine shafts like a like a like a like a glove of a person so the shafts all the, uh, the mine shafts are all gold as Soweto as Johannesburg was built on gold so what interests me about this mine shafts is that if you look at them, there's all of them, they are all have like 
three plants. Only three plants can grow there. Um, it's an eucalyptus, a satin reed, and a grass, and that's it. So that's, that's what startled me. That got me very curious to say, but why? Why do we have only those plants growing there? So um, I found out later that uh, it's a, actually, uh, there's, there's a history about uh, using cyanide. Um, that's why I think it's in, in the early 1900, uh, these two brothers uh, came, um, I don't gather their names very well, they came and they, they decided to use cyanide, which is very quick to um, mine gold and all that. So this shows you the danger of the people who lives in Soweto. So it, it kind of got me curious. And that's why I had to share this with you. It's a, it's a symbol for me. Um, if anybody would say, what is the symbol for Soweto? The mine dumps are the symbols for me. And as you can see that uh, most of the time in the mines, there's a lot of electrical um, poles and all that. It shows you the power of um, how we could use that electricity to only work on the mines and all that. Somehow when we drive along, it is oil and, and up in the mine, all the, the, the reed has got um, like kind of a yellow kind of goldish um, goldish uh, uh, thingy um, soil so that's that's the effect of the of, that's the effect of the um, of, of, of the cyanide so if we look on the I don't know if I can you can see my pointer on the sides uh, around so where to there are all the mine dumps around here so these are all the I would say the poison that people will never talk about in all that and one finds out about this once you do tours and you have different people. And I met a doctor who says, oh, I'm a doctor for um, a water mine or mining water. So these are all surrounding side of Soweto. So I hope um, there will be like a, an eye opener to many people to show how poisonous um, this place we live in is, um, if you go closer to the places where people live next to the mines, you can see the effect of the mine dumps and, and all that. So I had to stop here because I wanted to show you uh, the formation of Soweto, because Soweto was actually built after Sophia Town, as we, we kind of like um, very moderately saying the urbanization, the building of urbanization, but mostly it was like more like moving uh, Africans away from, from the towns and put them in, in townships. And Sophia Town was one of the most historical places in Soweto. So hence I stop here because it's got, it's got a, a very history, a rich history of uh, Sophia, as it says, I realized that Sophia means, uh, I just found out it's, it's something to do with the intellectual or intellect. Many people who come from there were, were very much, if, if they were singers, they were intellectuals, if they were, they were uh, musicians, if they were writers, they were uh, intellectuals. So that's why I, I had to show you this uh, place called Sophia Town before we go to Soweto, and you will see how strong it builds different townships and all that. So there's my Sophia town. Um, I will stop here again. Um, on Sophia town, we see that church, it's actually a church, it's an Anglican church. That's where it was, I could say for me, I, I think that was the, the center of Sophia town. That's where most of the most famous people uh, Nelson Mandela used to hang around there. Bishop Tutu comes from the Anglican church. Um, the very famous Huma Sikela, which we will see later, he got a, a picture from, um, he, he got a, a trumpet for, from Louis Armstrong through a very uh, kind man called Father Trevor Huddleston. As you can see how musical and, and thespic, uh, uh, theater-like so, so Town was like. So, I had to show you the, the richness of how people lived and 
amazing how people used to dress up. That a very when he just got a trumpet from um, Louis Armstrong, and it showed that the, 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 the glory of him. It was like a freedom, in in a way. He was that was the young Huma Sikela having this uh, trumpet, and um, unfortunately. There's, there's our favorite picture from Trevor Huddleston, the, the beautiful connection through um, Trevor Huddleston and, 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 and uh, Louis Armstrong and Huma uh, Sikela as a young boy playing the trumpet. So it, it, later that trumpet really blew the world and he traveled all over the world as you can see. Um, again, we go back to this place, there's our Trevor Huddleston. That's the famous picture of Trevor Huddleston. And the interesting part is that we, we get the picture of um, Father Trevor Huddleston with two kids. Uh, this is one of the most um, prominent artists of South Africa, um, Gerhard Sukoto, who unfortunately passed away in, 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 in France. And we never got to celebrate him in South Africa, um, but amazing work. There he is. Uh, 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 Dr. Sokoto, or however we can call him today. And he he had the so Sophia Town Life well elaborated. And those are some of the well um, published pictures of, of Sophia Town. As you we know, the, the, the singers like Miriam Makeba, Dorothy Masuku, and most of them they come from this amazing place. I just found out later that. Uh, there's Gerard Sukoto again, that actually in Sophia town, um, people used to walk around with novels and they used to show around, they used to brag around how they, they what they read and, 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 and everything. And the most famous writer then was uh, James Hadley Chase. So when you look at what we then became a language which was developed during Sophia town, which is then in Afrikaans, they say it's Tsotital, but actually it's not Tsotital. Tsoti means a thug, but actually it was a, it, it was a language which is the Sophia town people, they don't talk or the Elipratni, Elawiti, they witty. So it was a language for the witty people. And most of the Tsotital language, most of the language was taken from books like we use a, a name, uh, people, if you, even if you go to Soweto today and say, where is your Magriza? Magriza means your grandmother. And many kids in the township either, they don't know where this comes from. It's actually come from James Hadley Chase's book. And there was a grandmother whose name was uh, Magriza. So it, it shows how cultural this place and how, um, yeah, intellectual in many ways. Um, very famous picture of um, uh, Huma Sikela uh, and Miriam Makeba with uh, um, the, the, the brothers there, I forgot their name again now, uh, the Manhattan brothers, excuse me. And as you can see in the middle, we have uh, Jürgen Shadabek's picture, uh, We Won't Move, which is, it, 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 made, it made such a, uh, a, a strong, um, uh, what can I say, like a strong impact uh, in Sophia Town. Unfortunately, we lost uh, Jürgen Schoderbeck, I think last year. Um, yeah, so this, these are some of the most relevant thing that we show how lively and why people always talk about Sophia Town. Why would the people of Soweto talk about Sophia Town today? Shows how relevant this place was and how strong culturally, especially culturally, um, talking about the way they dress up, the way they, they, they walk, the way they, they used to meet and all that. And this will be a very powerful picture. Um, if you see there, like I spoke about uh, the language that was developed then that was called Tsotital or Elawiti. If you look on, on the right side, there's a, there's a thing written on Zdakni, meaning it's, it's, it's a bit of Afrikaans twisted, it meaning that we, we don't go. The whole thing, if you see the whole thing in life, it says on Zdakni, on Spola Iso. That means we're we, we moving, we're staying here. 
So that was one of the most powerful, um, I, I would say, motto of people of Sofar Town that time. There is the great uh, human system. Uh, the day the great they came from our day, Don Matera, uh, who is still alive today. And he wrote a beautiful, a beautiful poem. And I just want to dedicate this to you guys and just share this with you. Okay, and enjoy the poem for now. Don Matera, Sophia Town, 1962. The sun stood still in the sullen wintry sky, a witness to the impending destruction. Armed with bulldozers, they came to do a job, nothing more, just hired killers. We gave way. There was nothing we could do. Although the bitterness stung in us, in the place we knew to be a part of us, and in the earth around, we stood. Slow, painfully slow, clumsy crushers crawled over the firm pillars into the rooms that held us and the roof that covered our heads. We stood. Dust clouded our vision. We held back tears. It was over in the dust. The doses have As we can see, so I, I go there and, okay, so um, like I said, somehow we didn't get, because of load shedding, we didn't get some of the, um, the videos from that we've done. And so we will just show a PowerPoint um, and videos that will play around and bear with me when I fumble around with the system. He says, it's not mine, uh, okay. Okay, so as you enter Soweto, actually, the, the interesting part is that you you go through um, uh, uh, all the colored areas. So one thing I didn't mention about Sophia Town and in between Soweto and and Sophia Town now, recent as Sophia Town now, which is they moved people away from the, it was called Triumph, which is, means they have triumphed to move people out of Sophia Town or closer to the white community to the townships. So we're to Tembisa, Alexandra, Katlehong, and other townships. But Hey, the, fun, the interesting part, if ever you do a tour with me, uh, live tour, you would see that we go past colored areas, which is in other words, they say mulattoes, or in French, they say mitis. And, 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 and the, the colored areas in, in South Africa, it, it shows how strong color was, 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 was depicted in South Africa. So color was depicted so strong that uh, you had different colored people. So you have colored people, mixed colored uh, colors. You'll have, um, remember we had the Cape Malays who came with the, with the Dutch people from the, the East Indian company. Then you have the last color you would see are the African colors who are the, we, today we call the Khoisan or the Nama or however we can call them. So just next to Orlando, this is what the, the picture you're watching now. It's um, Orlando Station, which is um, it's. So now we are in Orlando. So Orlando is divided into Orlando East. And hey, sorry for that. Orlando is divided into Orlando East and Orlando West. So Orlando. East was the first Orlando that was built actually during apartheid time. Um, if you go closer to Orlando, you would see like um, Orlando East, you will see like all the old houses of, so of, 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 um, of Soweto. Um, so 
these houses mostly they were semi-detached houses, most of them. So the interesting part about this, there came a man called Sofas uh, 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 Banza, who had a Sofasoke uh, party, which organized to have more people as migrants were coming, more migrants were coming to Johannesburg to come and look for work. So then they had to build Orlando West and Orlando, Orlando East. And apparently Orlando was an American um, uh, developer who was given a task to do this uh, uh, job. And they, which is he could only build East and then the, the West was built later. But what's, what, what we see now, it's, it's a stadium, uh, the most famous stadium in, in Soweto, which is called the Orlando Stadium, where two most powerful teams in, in Soweto or in South Africa were, were founded, um, Kaiser Chiefs and Orlando Pirates. They were both founded by actually friends mostly. And it's amazing that that stadium, it's um, one of the most, um, how can I say, it's, it's, a, it's a big symbol of Soweto today. As you can see, there's a sign of Orlando Pirates there, the team and all that. And um, I, just across this, the, the stadium, you could see we have now in Soweto, this is a very interesting uh, thing that's happening because we now, oh, excuse me, excuse me. Um, sorry for this, sorry. Um, I have to, like I said, please forgive my fumbling sometimes. Uh, we have shakes. Uh, as you can see on the left side, we're having what we call shakes. And we have people from the rural areas of South Africa. And we have people from Mozambique. We have people from uh, Zimbabwe and other parts of Southern part of SADC, as we call it today. And if you can see next to that, the shakes, there's a, a river, which is, I think it's the, the um, the one coming from, it's, it's Club River, actually coming into Clip Town and all that. Like I said, we will... No! Around. Look how many. Okay, there's our Orlando Stadium. We go back to Orlando Stadium and show you um, the entrance of Orlando Stadium. This was actually revamped during the World Cup. Um, it was not on the budget of the World Cup in 2020, uh, sorry, excuse me, in 2010. So um, it was apparently the budget came from the municipality and they've done an amazing job. Um, although I've got a thing about maintenance, but they have, they would, they've done a very uh, interesting um, job in that. Okay, so, and the next picture we see here, very interesting. There's a very um, big uh, cup that happened uh, in, in, in Soweto actually, which is remember rugby was normally played by white people only in South Africa, uh, professional rugby, you know. Um, then we had a, a curry cup, which is one of the best, um, con our country symbol of rugby. And unfortunately, fortunately it was supposed to be held in Soweto. So it was held in Soweto and it, it brought such a beautiful magic in Soweto. Uh, because remember, um, many white people wanted to come and see this, these teams. They were all mostly white people and some few, I think there were two guys who were playing for, for the teams then. But then the interesting part is that people, white people were scared about this Soweto place. They thought cars were going to be stolen. Apparently even insurance companies, they, they upped their, 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 their upgraded the, the prices and, and all that. But unfortunately or fortunately what happened is like many black people around Orlando Stadium invited people for barbecue, for lunch and all that. It was such a, a magical time for South Africa at the time because we discovered ourselves. Uh, that's a picture with a Vovuzela in, 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 a, in a rugby stadium. And on the, this will be on your right hand side, actually. This will be what we call the women's hostels. Now it's interesting if you come from Europe, uh, when you talk about hostels and it's a different concept with uh, South Africa. Um, the hostels in South Africa are mostly where what we call compounds, 
you know, compounds. That's where people who are working are going to, to live there. But this one, only one is, it, it startled me because it's the only women's hostel that you find in Soweto. So children were not supposed to come here. The mother get a job and she gets registered and then she gets a, what we call a dom pass, which would be like a visa today. And when the mother gets that and then she can work in Johannesburg and she can go, always go back home to the rural areas. Remember, we were not considered as part of this whole formation of organization. We were just had to work and, and, and be workers. So in the new dispensation, as we call it today, um, most of them have been revamped and uh, been redone. And now the government today is trying to integrate families with the parents who, or the mothers who used to live in the, these places. So most of the ladies who lived here were mostly people who worked in, um, in domestic houses um, around Johannesburg. If you, if you remember when we started, we started with a stadium. Yeah, yeah, exactly. um, sorry, not a stadium, a station. That's where they will catch their train and go to work as, as domestic workers, most of them. This is a very famous picture of um, a very amazing photographer in South Africa, uh, Jody Bieber. And it's a, it's a stadium, it's, a, excuse me, it's a, it's, a, it's a swimming pool that was built some years ago in Soweto. That's one of the symbols we could, we could like pride ourselves on. And uh, this is the famous uh, swimming pool. And this swimming pool actually if you can see up there, there's a building up there. There was a very famous um, dance company that came out of there. It was called Street Beat. They went to America and they settled there, most of them. Amazing dance company. So many things, um, bodybuilding. So this was the, one of the places that kept Soweto going. Um, yeah. So as we drive a lot around here, we just passed the swimming pool. This will be Orlando West. Now, if you look on after this, uh, we call them taxis. There's our, our, our taxis on the, the blue car there, but we put the focus on that building that we just passed. It's a memorial, uh, which is very um, sad that um, in Soweto we have, we have this memorial that's been neglected. Um, this is Hastens uh, and Glovu. It's memorial. This was the first student who was shot. I just want to make things clear to, to many people because many people think that Hector Peterson was this first student who was shot. No, Hector Peterson was one of the youngest who was shot, but Huston Sintop was, was the first student. And there was a, unfortunately, which is, um, we're neglecting the young girl. If you, if we listen to Tsiatsi Mashinin, who was the leader of uh, the, 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 the movement then of the Soweto uprising, we supposed to have a, a picture or a memorial of a young girl, an eight year old girl whose body was riddled with bullets and nobody talks about her today. It's, it makes me emotional talking about that. So this, that, that will be Huston and Glovo's um, memorial. And this will be, um, okay, I've gone back there. Sorry, excuse me for that. I'll just run it because it's a very short video. Uh, it's very neglected, um, the, the museum. And everybody, when we come to Soweto, they would only talk about Hector Peterson and Victor uh, Villagazi Street and, and, and Nelson Mandela's house and, and, and all that. I like it, but I've got a problem about that as, as well because we, we are neglecting some people. Okay, we go on. Uh, sometimes I'll show you how Soweto develops. So there we are. This, um, this is the Hector Peterson's memorial. This is the famous place where whoever comes to South Africa, whoever comes to Soweto, it's like a, a spiritual place to see somehow. But uh, we talk about the picture. That's the picture, the famous picture of Hector Peterson, which is later I realized why we only talk about Hector Peterson, not Huston and Glovo and the young girl because this picture was taken by a, a, a photographer called Sam Zimmer. And when he took the picture, 
remember the education was so bad in such a way that people didn't understand the media. People knew about newspaper and everything. So people thought this, why is this guy? The, 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 the student thought he was a spy. Why he took that picture? And the police wanted to arrest him and the student want, hunted him. So he ran away, he went to far a place. If you know the Kruger Park, uh, there's a place called Bush Park Ridge. He stayed there until um, he passed on about three years ago. But going back to the picture, and then that time the picture was blown out by the German media. So this was the first time, and that's when the European countries were like, what's happening? That's why the, the picture. So on the picture, we have Hector Peterson, who is lying on the arms of uh, uh, the mystical, I, I say that, or the, yeah. Um, unfortunately, his name is uh, um, uh, Makubu. Um, and he, he disappeared. Nobody knows where he is. We were told he died in Botswana, Tanzania, Kenya. Um, and then he was buried somewhere, but we still like kind of looking for, for where his way about. On the picture on the other side, the lady, it's actually the sister of Hector Peterson, who became the director of the museum, the Soweto Museum, that's where we are now. And I ask her, we, 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 her famous name is, uh, her name is Antoinette, but she's known as Toto, you know. So I ask her, how come, how come the expression, what happened? And then she told me that, she told Hector that go home, this is not for your age. Because remember Hector was 12 going to 13, 14 there. So um, she said, go home. And unfortunately people called her and say, hey, come and see Hector, it's Hector who's been shot. So she was telling me that she was thinking about her parents and, and what, how is she going to explain the whole thing to, 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 her, to, to the parents. Okay, I'll take you um, for a thing in, in the museum. As we can see that we get, um, there's a lot of symbol in this museum here in, in, in the uh, place. Uh, there's one of the, 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 the motto of the, of, of the struggle for freedom and democracy. In this place here, actually, this is where, uh, Nelson Mandela in 1992 opened the space. He stood on the space and explained, uh, like thank the student of 76 for the resistance um, they have done during uh, apartheid time on this um, horrible education called band education. The whole thing about June 16, 1976, many people misinterpret the whole thing. They saying students were against the language Africans or against Africans. No, it's not true. The students were against Africans as a medium of instruction. So I make an example of myself. I was eight years of age at that time. Um, I'm, re I'm revealing my age now. <laughs> and um, I was asked, um, we were confused. Everything was burning. There was uh, army trucks driving around. We were like, what's happening? So one guy came to me and he says, um, you should take off your uniform because at school we, we wear uniform um, because they are shooting young boys with uniform. That means that's when after they shot Hector Peterson. So I went into one house, hide myself, turn my pants inside out and just real, realized later that, oh God, my, my pockets were white because you know it was still a black and white pants. So that's my, I was so scared. I was, I, I, it, it, was it was traumatizing. But um, going back to the museum, uh, people ask why the, the bricks, why the, the, the wall that we have there. With the wall there, most of the time, it's a, it's a symbol of um, how oppressive people of different colors were oppressed. I'll just take the video just back a bit, excuse me, um, just to show, because then we've got more space. Um, if you look up on the compressed um, bricks, it shows the spaces in between the bricks. Now, like I spoke about uh, Mbuiso Makubelo, who is the guy who is holding uh, Hector Peterson, those people disappeared. There's a lot of students who disappeared. And so 
the artist who did that or the curator uh, said it symbolizes the people who disappeared. Um, we, we don't know where they are. Some of them were killed, as especially the famous John Foster Square and all that. And the water that you see here will symbolize the tears and the blood of the students that fell during that time. Okay, so I'll just go play on this one. As you can see, I've gone back just to show you how the whole thing will flow. Um, the flow of the water, how strong and powerful this, this um, side was well curated just to present and preserve the history of that time of, of June 16, 1976. And the interesting part about this museum is um, you would you would see the, the I've got the olive tree there, the olive tree which is all over the world is a symbol for uh, peace. So it's not an indigenous South African tree. Yes, we've got all the dry olives in Pumalanga and other people, other places, but this is more on 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 the, the symbol of peace and all that. Okay, so that's me. Don't get scared there. Okay. Uh, we've gone back there. That's another one. That's a quick one. So I kept this one just to show how powerful when this whole thing is. And many people, when they come here, they really get very tearful when they listen to the sound of the water you know, and all that. So I will go on. Um, okay. So there's our museum again. The museum was made because of the, the stories, the stories that happened in 76. Remember the students were supposed to march peacefully to Orlando Stadium, which we saw. And the leaders were supposed to go to Orlando Police Station to give a memorandum to the commissioner and say, no, we can't take this education. I was still explaining myself about the education. Um, my mathematics paper was in Afrikaans, which is very and my we my teacher of mathematics couldn't speak Afrikaans. Now you can imagine giving somebody a language that they don't know. So what what does it mean in the museum? Unfortunately, because of um, the pandemic, we couldn't enter. In the museum, you can see how how old these people were, what age they were. That means you had to fail and fail and fail and fail. And remember that time, that time that was the time when in Europe or the first world countries, they were looking for the, 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 the IQ of the world, of a black man, of an Indian man, of a white person and all that. So you can see that they were asking, what, what, what is the black man, why black South Africans, I, What's their IQ? What percentage is it? And apparently we were, we were clocking very low. Meanwhile, there was a strategy to make us, you know, <laughs> be, look like we, uh, we have the lowest IQ ever. But that's mostly you, in, in the museum that was uh, very well curated as well. You find a lot of pictures of um, what happened of the students being short, how many students died and all that. Okay. So I'm just taking a picture of the museum. So on this site here, where I am here, um, it's a site where Hastin's father and the other side you will see it is coming on your left. It will be um, a, a site where Hector, uh, sorry, Mbuiso's mother is saying they were, not, they were not leaders. They happened to be children in that place. So they were not glorified as leaders at all, which is the part they played, they were supposed to pay to play it. Amazing because both of them of the of the memorial or the the, the stones, they just rhyme, they use the same kind of rhyme, and it's very interesting, very poetic and all that. Okay, so we go on. So I'm gonna stop here. This is the fa very famous place. This is the a picture of, unfortunately, as you can see all over the world, I used to think it's only in South Africa, wherever there's a steel, um, a memorial thing or painting or sculpture, 
they get stolen on and all that. So something has been taken here. This is the site where Hector Peterson was shot in June 1976. Okay. Uh, There's a street called Moyema Street. And Moyema Street takes us to Villagasi Street. And in Villagasi Street, we have Nelson Mandela's house. Now, this is a very interesting house because inside the house, um, you see the, the whole story about Nelson Mandela, but it's not about, many people is like, oh yeah, it's very touristic and it has become very Tupperware and all that. But if you go inside um, and just try to be an artist and look at the, 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 the ornaments and the furniture they use, very interesting. It's, um, I, I, I'm always, I've been trying to do tours for a long time and I've still go back to that house. And you can see Winnie Mandela there on the tap, uh, fetching water and all that. Um, now the house is a touristic place. It's a very, but now today, as we speak now, it's got a problem because um, there's a lot of, um, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, um, problem. The house is being um, liquidated. But um, tour guides and, and tourists organizations are trying to save the place. It's an, it's an amazing place. Um, in the house, okay, um, me as a dancer, a choreographer, there is a Nelson Mandela's bed, okay, because I normally pronounce it bed, um, bed. Um, remember he was taller in, 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 he was taller than his bed and on that, what lay, what, what's been laid on the bed, it's a, it's a, a, a skin of a, apparently a certain animal, if I'm not wrong, a jackal or something. And in Kosa, Kosa people use that symbol as a chieftain blanket. Okay. Um, next to the, to the, to the, uh, there is a, a kist or a cupboard with four pairs of shoes. So you find uh, the ones when he was training in, in, in uh, Ethiopia or Israel, there was one where he was in Robben Island, there was one when he was uh, a, a boxer. Um, it's actually three pairs. I have a mythical, I have my own perception about it, which is I wish I could still do that. Um, he was a dancer, that's what people don't talk about. He was a, a very bad, he says that he was a bad um, ballroom dancer. So I still see a show being done on that. Just the bed, nothing else, the bed, him and his two wives. Now with two wives, what people don't know is that he's, he had his first wife, Adelaide. And I, sorry, excuse me. Um, his first wife, um, it's not Adelaide, Adelaide Tambos. Uh, I remember the name because I've been mentioning names a lot. And she didn't like the whole fact that he was into politics because she was a Jehovah Witness. And, and by the time he was being recruited by Walter Sisulu and other guys, Oliver Tambo. So he was a, actually a criminal lawyer, Nelson Mandela. And when he was recruited, um, he met Winnie Mandela. And that's where the whole romantic thing started and all that. But now help me, maybe I'm, I'm crazy, um, the bed, the three pairs of shoes and the two women. The other one is religious, the other one is political. So I, I leave that to you to have an imagination, okay? There he is, um, well suited in his uh, office, in, um, in his office in uh, the chancellor's house in town. Uh, remember, like I said, he was, a, he was a criminal lawyer. Okay, we're going on. Um, we, like I said, now we will be uh, playing around with uh, the, the pictures and all that. We still, we still in so way to guys remember that um, time for pictures will come, time for um, questions and all that. Um, ask for more 10 minutes and all that. Okay, so that's my home. That's where I was born in 1968. Um, yeah, that's my brother who is a tour guide in Durban actually. And unfortunately because of the, the, the unfortunately because of the um, lockdown, he had to come back home. 
and me again welcoming you. And so, they, I, why do I do this? People say, why do you bring your mom, uh, your people in this place? Because I want people to, it's not a touristic place. Um, people to understand uh, how we lived and all that. Uh, this house is where just, it was just a three roomed house uh, with no, it was had like ventilation was so bad. And so we had to now later to put other rooms and all that. I know it's not all, um, yeah, but it's, it's, we had to put our own bathroom in the house and put extra rooms because now remember the families are growing and the numbers are growing as well. So fortunately for me, I became a dancer. Um, yeah, and, and, and these, are, these are some of the things we can show around about uh, friends coming to visit. It's typical, so it, people will just rock in, in the house. And um, well, me trying to uh, welcome you officially in, in this house. And um, I asked my mom who is still alive. Actually, she's gonna be 80 next, tomorrow. She's gonna be eight tomorrow. Um, she, this lady could tell you stories about Sophia Town, about the, um, her father going to World War II. Oh, amazing, you know. So I take a pride of bringing people to this place and, and just, just having an interaction, you know, a different um, life, a different experience, you know, um, and see how, how people survive. Many people say, but how did you survive this? And I normally say, I don't know. I don't know how I survive. And a lady, one lady said to me, most of the time you were probably outside. You were normally outside. And, and yes, we were outside most of the time because now this is what happens with the, with the, with the houses in Soweto. We, 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 we kind of get money, students student go to university or people go to work. And then we come back and then we extend the houses or put more big, bigger windows. Why? We, because we want more ventilation and all that. And I don't know how, if anybody, if anybody can tell me how we survived this, I really don't know how we survived all this, you know? So um, this is why, that's why today there's a, there's a thing that, uh, so what we has become a, uh, 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 what, what do they call it? Uh, a, working, is it a working class or a, a developing place. It has become a, a developing area, um, but mostly um, people are working on it. Other families are working on that stuff and all that. So um, yeah, many, it's me explaining um, to my, to my tour guide, to my, to my, to my videographer about, you know, we had small windows. Behind me, there was just one door. There was one door behind me. And um, the interesting part is that my father, he was a railway policeman, okay? Um, so many people ask me, but how come you became a dancer and your father was a police? And what happened to me, I was actually shot in 19... Um, it's 1990, 90, no, sorry, excuse me, 86, 87. I was shot, um, running away from the police. And then I was stepped uh, accidentally. Then I was, um, I was, I was, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was shot, uh, running away from the police. And yeah, it was tough. And one day I, I, I went to visit my grandmother. One day I went to visit my grandmother and I got caught up in, in, in what we say the hostels. That's why I, I showed a picture of the hostel. And if you remember in the beginning, there is a picture of me dancing to with, uh, with a lot of tires on stage. It's because uh, I was actually, I survived what is called neck lacing. Uh, if people don't know what neck lacing is, in the 80s, if you were suspected as a spy, okay, and 
people, students, whoever was there who had who had spread this 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 um, wrong um, information that could come and beat you up, and then put a tire on you, and then put petrol on you, and then boom, you burn. So I had a tire on me in a hostel. And fortunately, I was actually saved by um, a policeman. Uh, because remember, we had the municipality police, and then we had the, the normal police, the SAP or South African Police Service. And the South African police, uh, the, the municipality were mostly, I would say, I don't know it's a bad word to use, mostly illiterate. And that's why even in South Africa today, we have a problem of illiteracy in the country. Um, yeah, I had a t-shirt written CNA. So CNA, it's, an, it's a Swiss um, company, uh, insurance company. So these people read CNA, they thought he's from A and C. And I came from a place called in Netherlands in zone nine, and zone nine is where, because it was central, that's where all the meetings were held. So now you can imagine, I fall in zone one and the hostel, and they're thinking, boom, we've got one of the leaders. So that's why I got bitten up and to a pulp, I thought I'm gone and or dead. And the police came and they said to the people, okay, now we're not gonna, we're not gonna beat these guys anymore. We're going to arrest them because they are suspects. So that was during the state of emergency, which started in 1983 by the prime minister or president then called P.W. Bota. And um, he, he invented or started this, 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 this thing called the state of emergency and all that. So I, I stayed about 40 days in, um, in a police cell um, and the case was always remanded, always remanded until the last day when the magistrate said, okay, um, that's enough. Uh, we're gonna drop the case. And the case was dropped. So I was a suspect of somebody who was killed and I was a suspect for other things, for things I didn't know. I was 16 years of age. So my uncle who, was a former dancer with a company called, now it's called Moving Into Dance and other companies as well. He took me and he said, no, he was now teaching in a community center in Soweto. And then he said to me, ah, come and come out of the streets. So I went to the community center and he said, no, I want you to play piano because dancing doesn't pay. <laughs> And I went to the piano and uh, the piano teacher came only twice. He never came back. So I, in my uncle's studio, I saw young guys, young, young, young girls in tights and all that. As a young boy, I thought, let me try this. And I got hooked. I tried it, but he said to me, when the, the guy comes, you go back. So I got hooked into dance, um, dance for about eight months in his studio. Then we went to different auditions. Then I was in Johannesburg Youth Ballet. I mean, um, Youth Ballet was just for mostly white kids, mostly uh, white kids who came from the Johannesburg School of the Arts and, and white studios as we can call them today. And uh, these two teachers, um, uh, Benice Lloyd, who was, a, uh, who was a teacher to Charlize Theron uh, and, 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 and of Senegal and they said to me, oh, we need boys. So he said, no, you've got a good body, come, let's go. So I got hooked and they will give me extra classes and all that. And I did that, I fell in love with ballet. Uh, if you ask me why, I don't know, I fell in love with ballet. And the next coming here, which was, uh, I think it was 19, um, uh, it, it was 80, I lose my year sometimes, 88. I got a scholarship to study at uh, Johannesburg Dance Foundation. I got a three-year scholarship to study ballet, contemporary dance, and jazz dancing. And that's when I started doing things officially, you know, like having to do the real plie and contraction and all that stuff. And as time went by, I finished my schooling. 
um, I danced with a company, a lady called, an amazing lady called Adele Blank. She ran a, a company called Free Flight Dance Company, uh, which is now it has moved to Cape Town. And we danced there for some time, for a while. And then I got a scholarship to dance, to, to study in, in London through the Sainsbury's, through Nelson Mandela and Lady Sainsbury, who was a former dancer. Um, then everything became history. Um, you can see from the pictures, this uh, dance choreographed and dedicated to Nelson Mandela and all that. I am gonna take a break for a while. I just want you guys to take a break and then we can chat later again and all that. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope you'll still be there and all that. Just want to have a, a water break and all. Thank you, thank you so much, okay. Thank you to me. Thank you to me. Have a water break. Okay. And meanwhile, I will share while you drink and rest. First of all, so many uh, people are wishing your mother happy birthday. So I think that is absolutely fantastic. And I will send you the chat and you'll be able to, to see all the very, very good wishes uh, to, to your mom on her 80th birthday. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, to me, will you be happy to answer some of the questions if I'll pose those to you? Some of them are uh, very oh, yeah. interesting questions. Okay. Yeah, we can, we can, we, 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 we can talk, uh, we can answer. Unfortunately, I, I, before I answer questions, um, we've lost so much of, of our videos and um, so much has been compiled, like I said, because of the load shedding we lost so much and I apologize for that because I wanted to show you my Soweto and you know how it, it's growing and all that. But yes, we can go for questions. Okay. No, of course. And, and um, for all the uh, visitors from overseas that are wondering, what are we talking about load shedding? What, what oh, yeah. are we volunteering to give our load? Are we what shedding? The, the load, we are not. No, no. Uh, there is not enough electricity in the country and uh, there is a system that um, is installed. We, we, we are told when we will not have electricity and uh, in the last few weeks and months, we almost every day sadly had no electricity. So that's what to me is meaning that as he was building his video and you can see that he did all those separate videos and wanting to do just one video, yeah. load shedding happened in his area and he could not, uh, could not do, um, a, 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 could not finish the film. So, mm. so to me, maybe let's start with, first of all, the, the many people that are sharing uh, wonderful messages and maybe I'll start with that. Uh, I will start with a, uh, Joan Smith, that is saying a wonderful, heartwarming tour. You have come out tops to me. Your mom must be so proud of, of oh, all you. you have become. You so so I think that's uh, wonderful. Uh, uh, Yako is saying something and I would like you to respond because I think that is, it's a okay. statement, but I would love to hear what you think. So okay. Yako van Schaltzweig uh, uh, is saying, very special, thank you to me. I could recommend everyone to do a physical tour with to me through Soweto. I grew up near Johannesburg in a privileged white community. This was a real eye opener for me and unfortunately, many white people are still today scared or not interested to visit townships like Soweto. So maybe to me speak a little bit about this uh, fear or people that are afraid to go to Soweto and maybe talk a little bit about what do you do when you, you go and what do you show? Okay, um, for me, my most of the time it's funny when you Yaku thanks for the question but it's funny because um, when you do these tours and we get to Soweto many people they like oh but Soweto is like Europe and I'll be saying but what do you mean they say the streets are clean everything is organized and, and all that so if you drive if you go to Soweto you will realize that it's not what people have perceived so way to as it's a you you find um, I'll say I went to Kenya two a few years ago and one of our, our tour guides said 
when we got to Kibera and he said to me, oh, Kibera, the second biggest slum in the, in, in the world. So Soweto is the first and Kibera is the second. And I said to him, no, Soweto is not a slum. There are slums in Soweto, but they are not as bad as in, 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 in Kibera. But it doesn't mean that Soweto is different from other places, but it is because it's funny, it has grown. And again, we go back to the question of saying, people are saying, oh, when we white people go to Soweto, um, what will happen to them? Most three quarters of Soweto works in, in white areas. Okay, so um, there's one thing I always like to take people on, 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 on Thursday in Soweto. Why do I take Thursday? Because Thursday during apartheid, it was named Sheila's day. I don't know why the name Sheila, but Sheila, well, it's the day when all the maids were given a day off on a Thursday. I don't know who chose the day, you know, but, but then you, instead of them going for holiday or having a break, they go to church. So it's a very colorful day in so way to Thursday because you see all the ladies from Lutheran church, from Anglican church, from Roman Catholic, from the Zionist church, from the evangelical churches. It's, it's, it's an amazing flower, I, I call it, you know, uh, um, uh, what do you call, um, uh, yeah, picture, you know. So these are all the women who work in white people's houses. So, that's why I always argue with people, yes, there will be that one who would do something. And people will think, oh, they come from Soweto and they do this and do that. But most of the time, even for, our, for, for our, us, for most of the Soweto kids, we learned how to survive through what we say white places. Midlands Zone 9 is closer to Rodi Port. Um, we used to go there and do gardenings in, in white people's houses. And we couldn't have survived without that. So you know, you've got money for the movie, you've got money for this and all that. So I, I really don't believe that um, there would ever be a time when people stand up and say, oh, we're gonna, no, 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 no. It's, it's a, I think, I, I don't know. People have got their own co um, ideas today, but I don't think it will happen. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Dora Ashe is asking, can you talk briefly about Baraguanath? Oh, Baraguanath. Uh, Baraguanath, uh, a brief story about it is that Baraguanath is actually, it's, it, it sounds very African, the name Baraguanath. But the first name of the person, always we get lost of it, is either David Baraguanath or John Baraguanath. We're not sure, but, but there is a, an answer to that. But Baraguanath, he was, he was an Irish man. And that was his farm there in that what is known as Baraguanath Hospital today. And with Baraguanath, then the, the, the farm became a, um, a hotel, okay? Then they, because it was built next to the army, then they built, they built a hospital. So it became a, a, an, a, a, an army base hospital for the army. Then that's when Soweto was growing and then it became a Soweto hospital. But mostly Baraguanath, it's, it's, it's the third largest hospital in the world. Okay, so you get two in China and Baraguanath is the third one. And Baraguanath is actually an academic hospital. So many, many doctors coming from Europe, America and other parts of the world, they go there to learn about many things, about a lot of things, because you've got a lot of people, apparently it takes 5,000, it's got 5,000 beds. So you can imagine the number, you know, and the, the number of, of people who are um, being stepped, who are sick or who are, you know, whatever we can call it, you know. So yes, Baraguanas is famous for that. I don't know if I've, I've answered. Um, next to Baraguanas, there's a Baraguanas um, taxi rank. Uh, the Baraguana taxi rank, it's one of the largest taxi rank in the world. Apparently a year it takes 9 million people. I, somebody counted that. So it connects people in Soweto to what we say white areas and all that. So if you go to Baraguana, um, 
even today, even now, you'll see how many taxis are parked in that, in that parking area. It's quite huge, as big as the hospital. Uh, I want to share another comment from uh, um, 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 Katura Dlamini. That first of all, she says halalala, <laughs> and then she says uh, kumama uh, kula, a happy birthday. I was born yeah. a stone throw away uh, in Mofolo North. Ooh. Grew up in exile, and uh, Katura has an amazing story to tell herself. But yeah. it's amazing, and many of the notes are from people from areas next yeah. to you. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katura. Yeah, amazing. you know, you you know, they in 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 seventies from seventy six until let's say the late nineties, we 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 were inspired by most of people like him, you know, and very few people made it to exile, you know, because it's people just think that people just flocked to exile and all that. Um, I was supposed to be one of the people who were supposed to go. And unfortunately there was a, we go back to the, what we don't talk about, uh, about Soweto is like, there were a lot of spies then, you know? And that's what, that's the history that it, it's, it will be unfinished if we don't talk about that. And many of the people were killed. Um, some of them went to wrong camps. Some were recruited in wrong organizations, which, uh, you know, the, 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 which were very domesticated, it causes the domesticated uh, problem of, of political South Africa. So these are kind of people that we, 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 we actually respected. And unfortunately during the new dispensation um, or the reform, there was all the issues about who fought, who didn't fight and, and oh God. But yeah, that's that's freedom. <laughs> um, Ian Brown is asking a really interesting question. So he's thanking you very much to me. And uh, he says, I can imagine it can be a challenge to balance a desire to introduce Soweto to the world and at the same time protect uh, the privacy of those living there. So putting aside that some might not be as respectful as one would hope, even a high level of uh, curiosity could prove overwhelming in uh, the community. How do you manage this on the tours you give? The privacy, curiosity of people, yeah. and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting because uh, you, you have people who are very, um, I'd say pushy, let me just use the word, pushy and they will just take pictures and then whoever's coming and, you know, and, and, and sometimes you find people who are scared, you know, and, but, but the, the best thing is like when, once, um, I'll talk about a very experience, a very interesting experience I had of a, um, a Rotary from Cologne, which is like about a big bus of, 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 if I'm not wrong, 35 people or something. And the, on this Rotary group, there was a man who was walking. So with my tour, we get off um, at Hector Peterson and then we walk through up until Nelson Mandela. The trick is I normally say to the people, well, you have to find Nelson Mandela. The treasure is Nelson Mandela's house. So you have to tell me, which is very obvious because once you turn left into Villa Gaza Street, you see where the group is. That's where Nelson Mandela's house is. But this man stopped me and he says, wow, um, yeah, I now understand. This place, it's amazing. Um, I thought, if you want to see a slum, if you want to see a dangerous place, if you want to see a place where people don't look at you or go to Haiti, now you'll see that, you know? He says, it's amazing how people in Soweto, they have they, they have acclimatized themselves to the people, but not everybody is, but then there is a respect to that. You talk to your people and tell them that, please, if you wanna take a picture, unless they, 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 they people will come. It's a very interesting thing in, 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 in the townships because if they see you with a camera, they come and they say, shoot me, shoot me, shoot me, you know? And then, and then you can take a picture. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's got a question also, that whole thing of shooting me, shooting me. But people can just, somebody can just come and pose for you and you're like, wow. And people will tell you, you don't see that in Europe, you know? And the other thing is like, 
you will have to greet people. Now, if you want to practice Ubuntu, come to Soweto. You have to, when you pass, you see an, an elderly lady passing, say hello, just say hello. You will, you brighten up their smiles. Because remember, these people are the people who used to work many years for this, maybe bad guys um, and maybe racist guys. And now suddenly here you come, you say hello. And they, they, they always give you this second look. It's like, is he really greeting me, you know? And then I'll affirm it and I said, oh, mama, greetings to you. And they will, they will just, oh, they'll be so happy. So those are kind of things you, you have to, uh, as they say, you have to be vigilant in a way, you know, to know your way and be friendly with the people. Yes, there'll be doubts from both sides, from the tourists and all that. But Villa Gazi is the place where you can walk with your camera on. Okay, you can have, you can hang your camera there and nobody will bother you. Okay. Entle is asking, um, is there a reason why the public pools are called Jakes? Do you oh, know? there is a there is a there is a there is a um, <laughs> I I think I asked my late brother and he told me that uh, there was a famous uh, swimming pool that was called Jake. Jakes, and then and then uh, all of a sudden, all the public uh, public swimming pools were called Jakes. That's the name I know. You know, um, it's funny she's asking that question because uh, uh, we we have developed a language within ourselves. You know, and some people think, oh yeah, but it's very literate the way you're saying it. But things like a toothpaste will always be a Colgate. Okay. And, and, and um, what do you call them? Um, there's conflicts. Conflicts will be the, the flakes, will be conflicts. All of them, it doesn't matter what company makes them. So it, 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 people, a Coke will be, a, any cold drink will be a Coke until you mention it and say, oh yeah, oh, please buy me a Sprite. But they will say, please buy me a Coke. Okay, there's a lot of things that we have twisted around. It's, it's interesting, language is just, amazing how we have uh, survived through with that, you know, with, with all the nine other tribes, you know, besides English and Africa. Remember, we have 11 official languages. So there's, you, somewhere when I speak to somebody, if I'm, if I'm going to, coming from Netherlands, if I go to Dubai, I know that I have to put a bit of Zulu and Tosa Bay somewhere, you know. And then when you go to Shawela, there has to be a bit of Shangani there. And, and that brings interest in, 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 in the whole thing. Yeah. You, you know, to me, it's amazing. So Jill Murray is saying that Jake's in the UK is slang for, uh, for the loo, you know, laboratory. <laughs> so now it's interesting. So Mark Wamaka from Rwanda is saying, I love the similarities with Rwanda. So in Rwanda, also in Kenya, Rwanda, you know, there are all those names. Yeah. So. But, but you might find you might find it is the same thing because remember, uh, so where to? It's what people don't know. It's very English. You know, if if you lived in London, if you go to I forgot Brixton and other places, it's just that it's been built with high. School uh, buildings, but when you look at the bricks, they look the same, and and you talk about something, they talk about something. So it's it's very like that, you know. So it might be, it might, but they might be right. They might be right. Uh, there are lots of uh, comments and in, in, in people sharing all sorts of reflections that uh, you'll be able, and I'm inviting everyone to, to read the chat because lovely, lovely, you know, comments and history uh, yeah. and, and lots of wonderful uh, things to you and, and your mom and uh, yeah. your achievements, you know, and, and, and yeah. so on. Um, we have a, a Aisha Huzuk, a, a teacher, uh, that also grew up in the vicinity. And Aisha, uh, I wonder if you can unmute yourself and uh, come in and just talk about your experience from an Indian uh, perspective about exactly what Tumi was telling, but on an Indian perspective. And Kath, I wonder if you can, if Aisha, you can come on video, if uh, um, Kath can um, put a spotlight on you. So we, we're trying to look for you, if okay. you can come on video. Here, Aisha, I can see Hi. you. Yeah. 
Good. Hi. Good evening. Thank you so much, Tali. Thank you. So this topic to me is so close to my heart because as you were talking, it was really living my own childhood. When oh. you said you were eight years old, I was maybe a little bit older, but yeah. everything you were saying was just reminiscent of my own history, of my own past. So oh. I won't, I'll just share a little bit about my education. During apartheid, anyone who was not white was considered black. So yeah. it was the colors, it was the blacks and the Indians that were considered black. Yeah. So where we were living, there were schools and we could have gone to the schools which were close by within walking distance. But when the, when the, uh, the law came in for the Mixed Removals Act, uh, the Forced Removals Act where they moved people from the areas they were living to their own independent areas like uh, Indians were moved to an area called uh, Lanasia, the yeah. coloreds were moved to El Dorado Park and yeah. the black people went to Soweto. So yeah. even though there were schools close by to us, those schools were now declared white schools. So we yeah. couldn't go to school there anymore. And I know that I had to travel, I had to travel long distances. I had to get up at five in the morning. It just feels like it was yesterday. Wow. Like yesterday. It feels it was yesterday. You know, yeah. we had to get up at five in the morning. It was a yeah. long way to the railway station. Yeah. And at the railway station too, there were, there were two entrances to buy your tickets. Yeah. The majority of the black people were using public transport, but there was mm -hmm. one window serving all these thousands of blacks. Mm -hmm. There were two windows serving whites who hardly used public transport because they had their private cars. It's true. And we'd have to stand in the queue to mm -hmm. get our ticket. Once you get into the, once you've got your ticket, you're getting down, you just see the train passing you because it takes you so long to maneuver your way. <laughs> from the, from the Absolutely. Yeah. And once you get down onto the platform, there must have been about 10 coaches, which were for whites, it's all true. of them passing you empty. It's and true. for the blacks, there's about three coaches and they are packed to capacity. It's true. It's so true. if you make it, if you are fast enough, you'll get onto the train. If yeah. you're late, you miss that train and you'll be late for school, yeah. half an hour late. You yeah. get to the school, the school gates are closed. It's no fault of yours. Yeah. It was just really difficult. It was difficult. I realized the difficulty not at the time when I was experiencing it, it was fun, you know, it was what we were doing. It felt yeah. normal. Yeah. But it's later in life when I realized it was difficult. So was, I'll just now take you to matric here. Yeah. So it was very difficult to pass matric. You know, the government had a quota. Very difficult. X, X amount of Indians, blacks yeah. and coloreds, yeah. there was a quota to enter university. So regardless yeah. of how well you did in your matric, you were not going to pass. Yeah. Now I came from a very, from a very humble home. My father was very hardworking. We didn't have a car. It was difficult. Life was yeah. truly difficult. You know, the end of the month, everyone was scraping the barrel to make yeah. ends meet. And I knew there was no way that I can fail the trick because there was too much of an investment that went in here That's from true. my point of view, from my parents' point of view. And I was really, really putting all my effort into this matric I had to pass. And I yeah. remember, the year I was writing matric, it was the final exam. It was four in the morning and my mom was getting up to do her prayers. And she said to me, haven't you gone to bed yet? And I said, no, mom, I already slept. I got up now to start studying. In the meantime, I hadn't gone to bed because oh. I was determined I needed to pass. Long story short, the matric was written. And when the results came out, the principal called us to school and we assembled in the hall. And he said, I have the matric results but I got very bad news from 800 students who wrote only 12 of you have passed matric. Yeah. I was so sure to me that I yeah. am in that 12. There was no way that I was not going to pass. Yeah. And so he started calling out the names and he called and they hadn't called mine and we're number four and we're number three and we're number two. And by this time I was absolutely shaking in my boots. I thought there's two names left. It's got to be me. Yeah. And you know, he called the second last one and he called the last one. And once again, it was not me. Ooh. There's just no ways to explain that. There's just yeah. no way it's, to explain the disappointment I felt for myself yeah. as well as for my parents. 
Yeah. So yeah. I know what went into it. Yeah. And I know that I didn't fail because of not being competent. I know oh, that. True. You know, um, just, just to talk about your metric, I did my, met my metric three times. Uh, 84, there was a lot of, um, if you remember 84, there was this whole about corporal punishment because yes. the teachers also bought into this and they were, they were punishing us like, like we were just nothing. And, and unfortunately for me, my first metric, um, my elder brother was diagnosed with, with schizophrenic. So the night when we were, tomorrow we're writing, the police brought this man who was no more my brother, you know? And he left school at Standard in Standard 7 and became a salesperson and he was doing so well. But now we were shattered to see all this. And then I repeated my next metric, that's when I was detained and everything, the whole thing happened. Uh, because I, then I became a dancer, I wanted to show my father that, you know, now, now the, the funny thing about that, it's, it's a, you, you're talking about it because then when I became a dancer now, I'm in a Johannesburg youth ballet. Now I'm with the white kids now, okay? Yeah. And they speaking English, but they speaking the other English, you know? Yeah. Uh, I always say to friends and say, I remember explaining to this teacher, the ballet teacher says, um, I don't understand this word, um, uh, de determine. And this guy stood up and said, yeah, don't, don't pronounce it like that. It's not determine, it's determine. But I was like trying to find where, why determine? Because there's a mind there, like a mind will be a mind, you know? So, and then I went to school and I, 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 and, and I was reading this comprehension test. And I said, I went determination. I said, oh, determine, I said, uh, determine, determine. And the teacher was like, oh God, where have you, what's happening with you? You know, are you studying somewhere? Are you doing extra classes? But because now I was listening to what we say, the real thing, you know? Yeah. And yeah, it, it, it got me to ask a lot of questions because even when, when, when I hang around with African students, yeah. by the way, the funny thing, that metric when we did, it, which is, there must be, a, there's a big question. We did a Dutch book. It shows that these people were, 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 were were in, on a mission to make us fail. There was a book called Seske, which was yeah. a Dutch book. No, it was not Afrikaans, it was Dutch. So we were studying this book for metric, but it was a Dutch book. So, the, you know, what you're saying, I don't blame you for being emotional about it. Because I, and remember, we, you have to pass, um, which was called standard eight, which was called JC, junior certificate, yes. which was, you could be a teacher, you could be a nurse, and once you go to metric, you could be a uh, doctor, whatever. Yeah, yeah. those are the hard times. Those are the hard times. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for reminding me of it. Thank no, you so thank much. Thank you. You know, as you were talking this whole evening, it really took me right back there. I could so yeah. resonate with everything that you were saying. It's just another yeah, it, world. If you haven't lived it, I think it's yeah. really difficult to understand it. But and, you and, can share it with somebody who has lived it because yeah. we some, we're just speaking the same language. And same and and many people are always say to them they say, oh yeah, but you had your you had your independence twenty four years ago and done, and I'm like you know what people don't know that that was a psychological oppression more psychological than physical, and that's why even today really me that I've got a brother who was a psychiatric patient, uh, God bless his soul he passed away last year, um, thirty three years he was under psychiatry. Now, if you want to know Baraguana, go to the psychiatric ward. You will see what has happened, what, what the apartheid has done to the people, the minds, and it's shaming, you know. So, yeah, it's a tough time. It was tough. It's still tough in a way, you know. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Aisha, thank so you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sally, for the opportunity. Just yeah. to conclude that, uh, you. Uh, to me said that he did matric three times. I wrote my matric after, after I was married and I had kids. Oh, I, did, okay. I went to adult basic education oh, yeah, to get the matric. And I got all my qualifications later, later on in my later, life. Later. But I was really just so determined. And I'm so That's grateful great. to my friend Tully from the time that I connected with her. She really was so encouraging, so inspiring. And I yeah. must say, Tully, my education really 
my teaching career started through you at the foundation. Up oh. till that time, I wasn't into teaching. And I started my teaching career degree after that. Yeah, So about, really, I want to say, Tully has yeah. been really a pillar of strength <laughs> to me and encouraging me all the way to where I am today. And I'm yeah. eternally grateful to you, Tully. Even though I don't see you all that often, you are always in my heart and in my mind. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Aisha. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mutual admiration club. So as you know, yeah. so back to you, no, Tully. I just, I just want to say that I, during my dancing years, then I, uh, there was a time for six years I volunteered to run, uh, to help or teach in a center for um, children or creative center called Renale Luna, an amazing um, creative center for children. And I was there for mostly almost six years, you know, became a manager. Didn't, I didn't make a good manager because I was missing it, dancing and all that, but I became back, became a dance teacher again. And um, now I met Tali um, and I realized that she was one of our supporters. It's amazing. It's a small world. We were talking about it. It, it is a small world, but let's not talk about me. So yeah. um, we move back to Soweto and we move back to, to you. And as we are about to close, uh, I just want to share with you to me the many, many thanks uh, from people all around and uh, really amazing, amazing um, notes. Maybe I'll, I'll share with you from Albert Lichtblau. He's joining us from Austria. Uh, oh. He's a professor in Salzburg and he's okay. saying, I'm very impressed. I want to come back because he, he visited Southern Africa uh, yeah. before a few times. As he said, I want to come back and book another tour mm. and hopefully with you to me. Nice yeah. to have yeah. worldwide community to celebrate Tumi's lovely mother's birthday. And I think this Thank says you. it all. Beautiful, beautiful tour, uh, wonderful sharing of your personal story. Aisha, your personal uh, experiences were so really adding another experience from another community because Tumi, yeah. you shared from your, uh, from your experiences and, yeah. and uh, Katura, also with her uh, yeah. chat uh, a, a mentions of the exile, being in Lagos, being in Nigeria, mm -hmm. and um, all those uh, experiences that she had. And the many other, Les Kuhn, thank you so much for answering many of the questions and many others that uh, added historical yeah. anecdotes and historical stories uh, for yeah. it and uh, really appreciate that. Thank you um, so to me, last word before we, we, we close and, and then I will close. Any, any last thought uh, from you? Um, all, all I can say is that uh, what, what I've learned is like, uh, it's just, uh, just amazing. The world is an amazing place. Just open your heart, learn, um, accommodate people. Um, I, I've experienced a very interesting thing, sorry, to. Um, I've got a I've got a 24 year old daughter. When she was doing her metric, uh, a me, a me, um, not metric, a standard grade 10, she wanted to leave me mathematics. She says, "No, I hate this this subject." And and you know, and I said, "No, but you have to do it because we need it in South Africa. We need ma mathematicians." And the funny thing, I said, "Please try to love it. Try to love the subject. I will support you, whatever." Guess what, Tali? My daughter to be so she is a Met's tutor today, you know, and all I'm saying is that let's 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 learn to love something that we, we maybe we we hate something, but let's try to to love it, and then we'll see miracles or something different. Uh, let's all open our hearts, and I hope everybody is uh, safe and taking care of themselves during these difficult times. And thank you very much for the support. Thank you so much. Oh, thank thank you. you to me. And just to close uh, from all of us, thank you to me. Thank Pleasure. you, Petra, uh, the Silt Foundation, the staff of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Foundation. Uh, just wonderful to, to have all of you from all around the yeah. world. Uh, joining wow. us tonight and I hope that we will see you on Thursday night if you have nothing to do 
we have a webinar together with the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center at seven o'clock. And we will meet Rebecca Clifford from Wales in uh, the United Kingdom. And she will talk about her new book, uh, Survivors, Children's Lives After the Holocaust. And her research is absolutely phenomenal and interesting. So good night to all of you. Stay safe, stay nice. healthy. See you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.